So the, the first thing I suppose to say about this novel is that uh, it's got herring gulls on the cover and people who are in Brighton or somewhere along the south coast will be, uh, I hope, engaged by the attention to herring gulls in this book. And uh, I myself live in Seaford uh, and, and so I'm very familiar with the kinds of challenge that the herring gull poses to us. Uh, but also I, I'm very uh, struck by their beauty and uh, I find them absolutely compelling, fascinating creatures. So this book is, is called An English Guide to Bird Watching and when the uh, designer, who I think is in Haywards Heath or somewhere up that way, uh, when he put this together there was a strong feeling that uh, there would need to be a splat in the top right corner saying a novel. But the first thing I would say about this novel uh, is that the title is a title that is meant to kind of catch you and you read it and you think, an English guide to bird watching. So that's all if solid, no, hang on. That's, what is that? Uh, it is a book about uh, bird watching, uh, but it's also about deception and it's about, in a more general way, language. Uh, and some of those things were, uh, I think, touched on very interestingly by, by Will in, in his talk just now. So there are two parts to the novel. The first part is mostly set in Seaford. Some of it ha happens in Manchester and London. Uh, it's about a retired couple. They lived in Croydon. They were undertakers and they've moved down to, uh, to Seaford to spend their twilight years. They're called Silas and Ethel. Uh, and they have a horrendous time with the seagulls. Um, so that's the first part of, of the novel. I, I, I could say more about it, but uh, I, I think that's probably sufficient. It, it, it all really kind of focuses on a, a short story called uh, Gulls, uh, which was written by the uh, retired undertaker about his travails with, uh, with, with seagulls nesting all around them uh, uh, in their new house uh, in Seaford. So that, that kind of takes you up to about page 220 or something. Uh, and then there's a second part to the novel, which is called The Hides. And uh, the hides are, I suppose, the meaning of, uh, of hide, as you probably uh, are aware, uh, you know, primarily it's a, an observation hut for, for watching birds. So for, for the, uh, a screened off location for the observation of birds. But I'm, I'm trying, I suppose, because I'm interested in language, um, like Will, I'm trying to explore the different possibilities of this word hide, which I think is one of the most interesting words in the English language, uh, and trying to think about the hide also as a, a kind of observation place for, for talking about the novel itself, not this novel necessarily, but, but in a more general way. What is a novel? Why do we read novels? Why do we write novels? So uh, the hide in that sense is a kind of place in the novel that is outside the novel, if that doesn't sound too weird. Okay. And I thought I would read uh, a couple of the hides. There are 17 altogether. Some of them are really, really short. Like one of them is only seven words long. I won't read that one. Um, yeah, unless by popular demand. <laughs> um, but I thought I would read one very short one uh, uh, that's just a, a paragraph and then read uh, from the beginning of a longer one. So just before I start reading, this is Hyde 9. Um, I'd say to sort of link up with something that, that, that Will was saying. Dickens wrote about ravens, but he did also have one of his own. Um, and so there's a reference to that in, in this hide. Uh, I think I make up a word in this book. There's, there's one word which 
I believe I have kind of made up uh, and, and I hope I've done something mm. new with it. Uh, and it's the word uh, ornithomorphism. Uh, so this is a word which literally means in, in Greek, I suppose, in the shape of the bird. And it's modelled on the idea of anthropomorphism. And everybody's probably familiar with anthropomorphism. We had a very good example of it with Jemima Duck. The, the ways in which we project human characteristics onto non-human creatures or, or indeed inanimate objects like the legs of a chair or the face of a clock or whatever. So anthropomorphism is one of the interests of this book, but um, even more so uh, for me is the idea of ornithomorphism. So if you're baffled, uh, you would be. Uh, I, I hope reading this paragraph will slightly clarify it for you. Language, so this is Hyde 9. Language is variously anthropomorphic and ornithomorphic. Anthropomorphism may seem to spread its tentacles everywhere. But what about ornithomorphism? Think of Mozart. He kept a starling and he knew backwards what he was talking about, dreaming of singing and composing Twinkle Twinkle Requiem. Think of Dickens. He kept a raven and he knew backwards what he was walking about, dreaming of scribing and croaking the voices of the streets and the oppressed, police rookeries, sniff-pecking and missed flights. But hold a space, too, for the other way round, the starling that kept Mozart and the raven that kept Dickens. People speak of a man whose wife has proved unfaithful as a cuckold, for example, with little or no awareness that this is an ornithomorphism, deriving from the old French cuckoo for cuckoo. But then, in a silly or slightly mad anthropomorphism, people also appropriate the bird in order to, distinct, to designate someone as silly or slightly mad. For Wordsworth, on the other hand, the cuckoo embodies poetry itself. It is a wandering voice, an invisible thing, a mystery. Cuckoo, cuckoo, a word can be a hide. Okay, so that, that's uh, hide nine. Uh, and then I thought I would be, uh, read the beginning of hide 11. Uh, I'll perhaps just say in passing that uh, one of my, um, one of the things that most, uh, I suppose, excites me about this book is the illustrations uh, and I, I feel extremely honoured and, and fortunate to have uh, a friend, Natalia Gasson, uh, who has produced uh, a number of really marvellous uh, line drawings uh, for this book and if anybody picks up a copy you can see, uh, you can have a look at them. For example, at the end of the hide that I'm going to read the beginning of, um, there's an extraordinary drawing of a, of a dodo. Um, which is modelled on, in fact, the dodo in uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. So uh, this, uh, this hide, hide 11, what, what might you need to know? There's a reference to Virginia Woolf, which is actually, you've already heard it. So close to committing suicide, she's hearing the birds singing in ancient Greek. There's also a reference to Asham Wharf. I don't know if anybody has... A, a knowledge of Ash and Wolf, uh, near Rodmel. It's where Virginia Woolf's body was washed up uh, three weeks after she drowned herself. And there's also a, a reference here to a woman called Phoebe Snetzinger. Has anybody heard of her? No. So w one of the things that really struck me when I was writing this book was how much uh, ornithology is about men, right? It's a very kind of male preserve and there are very few women in the history of the writing uh, uh, about birds and very, very few women who um, bird watch. Uh, and Phoebe Snetzinger is a spectacular exception. So she's worth looking into, finding out about uh, what she what she did, she had cancer, um, she was going to die and she refused treatment and she went bird watching in Alaska instead 
um, and she was cured. Um, she was actually killed in a road accident on Madagascar some years later when she was trying to, to, to spot a bird. Um, to add to her <coughs> list of 8,900 and something, which was, I think, at that time, the world record. So there's a reference to, to Phoebe Snetzinger uh, as well. So this is a, a hide about a, a woman who doesn't have a name. Um, and in, in many ways, this, as I say, being a novel about the nature of language and our relationship to birds is a novel in part about anonymity or the nameless or the unnameable. And so uh, that's something that this Hyde is also trying to explore. Hyde 11. It is a raw winter's morning on an exposed stretch of Norfolk coast. There is brilliant sunshine, but a bitter wind. She is wrapped in her warmest winter coat and boots, prepared as best she can for a freezing walk and standing about with her mother's old field glasses, picking out an avocet here, a sandpiper there, in the shallow water of the intertidal pools and on the adjacent sand flats. She takes a seat in the hide as if finding her way at a theatre after the lights have gone down. She is vaguely aware of other bodies huddling up this side and that, enabling her to plant herself somewhere near the front and gaze out at the waders and other birds. She stuffs the field glasses back into a deep pocket in her coat. She hadn't expected to find herself here. She feels trepidation. She is no birder. Serious bird watching is to her as foreign as train spotting. She knows next to nothing about the interior life of twitchers with their feverish binoculars and telephoto lenses mist nets and ringings, sightings and list compilations. If she were in a novel, she would have some distinctive, rather enigmatic name such as Penelope Menace. Penny or Pen for short. But she is not in a novel, she is in a hide. There is a quietness that recalls the undirected anguish pervading an empty corridor in a hospital or the laceration of leaving the September sunshine and going through the big red door on her first day at primary school. She thinks of London taxi drivers who have the knowledge and of birders who have theirs. There is knowledge she will never have and in the half light of the hide it is pressing in on her from all sides. Her mother liked birds but was no Phoebe Snetzinger she had a good pair of binoculars and carried them when out on long walks in the country or visiting bird sanctuaries. But it was an interest the daughter had observed and humoured rather than shared. Real birders were obviously men. They must start picking it up from early boyhood. Boys and their fathers. There are, she notices, a couple of mothers and girls here in the hide, but they figure differently. She doubts that they have the knowledge in the same way. Ornithology is a man's world, or it is at least, by and large, written by men. She is not crazy like Virginia Woolf when the birds start singing to her in ancient Greek. Still something is happening. You might die tomorrow or before the hour is out. She has thought that very often for many years. But now death appears differently. It has moved distinctly closer, even at moments it seems within smelling or tasting distance. It resembles a troubling version of that children's party game where you are at the front with your back to everyone and try to catch one or more of them moving when you turn round. You look at a woodland scene, a crowded railway station, your room with its simple furnishings. Only death brings death near. That thing called by whatever fugitive name, has edged up in camouflaged closeness, but you cannot see where or how. A girl behind her, who can't be much more than 13, whispers something to her mother and giggles. Somewhere to her right, one birder mumbles something to another. The woman looks ahead, trying to set aside the mild intrusiveness of other people, the collective smell of rain jackets, rubber boots and tweeds. 
In her peripheral vision, she picks up the profiles of people with raised binoculars close to the window. At the same time, the hide remains shadowy, and for a moment it is as though some gyrating snowy mass of shadows were passing over her eyelids. She is not crazy like Wolf when the birds start singing in ancient Greek. Still, as a character called Penelope Menace, she would pass the entire duration of a novel walking about in the Sussex Downs around Rodmel. Every detail of flora and fauna, weather and feeling, history and culture, space and time consciousness should feature, along with dozens of digressions. On her rambles, she would see the stranger painting on the hill. She would follow him through her field glasses. They would meet. In the end, however, she would be alone. She would wander out into the brooklands to stand at Ashen Wharf. She would stand and wait and wait. She would wait at Ashen Wharf for Wolf to come washing into view, bubble up from the stony depths and sing to her. But she is not in a novel, she is in a hide. Thank you.